we became aggressive about everything being passive. Uh, and, and that's something that we've, we've, we've carried on uh, throughout our investment journey. And I, I'll just say there that, you know, like you, I'm on a mad mission to motivate as many hardworking Aussies as I can to recognise that if they don't start developing what I call parallel perspective, and that is using one eye uh, to look at today in terms of what they need to do, but the other eye in terms of what tomorrow is going to, needs to look like. Because if, you, if you're clear on tomorrow, uh, that shapes today and eventually you'll get to a point where they come together. Welcome to Get Invested on the Property Hub podcast channel, the leading weekly show to help you unlock your full self, health and wealth potential. I'm your host, Bushy Martin, and each week I go deep with the best investors, experts, leaders and founders to find out what it takes to break free from the grind, discover freedom and live by design. Subscribe now and join me and get invested in the life you really want. Let's get started. Welcome to a special episode of Get Invested on the Property Hub podcast channel. I'm Andrew Montesi, the producer of the show, here to kick things off for our usual go-to host, Bushy Martin. This week, we're sharing an amazing interview with Bushy from PK Gupta's Australian Property Mastery Show. With PK at his side, Bushy unpacks his best insights from his own real estate journey, including what it takes to replace your income, when to expect results, as well as his own personal property journey. You're going to love this one, so sit back and enjoy. Hi, everyone. My name is PK, and here I'm super grateful to have Bushy Martin with me. It's going to be a really special episode because we're talking to someone who's basically replaced their income <laughs> through property, which is what we're all trying to do, right? And some of us have achieved it. Some of us are on the way. Some of us are just thinking about it. So how powerful is it to speak with someone, to get the insights from someone who's kind of been there and done that? We're going to talk about uh, Bushy's background and portfolio. We're going to talk about this concept called lifestyle design, which honestly, I need to learn more about as well. We're going to talk about like the traps and misleadings in 2023 in the property market, you know, Bushy's best advice in terms of raising, rising interest rates. What can we do about that? And just mindset as well, you know, from someone who's, who's been there and done that. And just, I know this is going to be a long introduction, but I just want to do Bushy a lot of justice because he is the founder of Know How Property Finance. He's helped more than 1700 people trying to achieve and have achieved what he has achieved in terms of property um, investing. He's also a podcast host on Get Invested and Realty Talks, you know, really reputable uh, podcast sources. I highly recommend you check out. He's an investor. Like I said, he's got 12 properties, actually, the same as me. Uh, he's a speaker. He's an author of like books like The Freedom Formula, Get Invested. And he's all like, the way that I found out about him was just in the media, like on ABC and um, news.com and, and all these places. Places. So without me waffling on, I just want to say a little bit um, humbled and, and very grateful to have you on, Bushy. Uh, likewise, uh, PK. I'm uh, very humbled to be in your presence. We, we, we might be 20 odd years apart, but we've followed very similar parallel pathways, uh, PK. So it's, it's great to rub shoulders with someone like yourself who's on a similar mission to help hardworking Aussies to be able to find their version of freedom, however they decide to define that and, and again you 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 walk the talk and what, what I like about you PK given the chats that you and I've already had is that there's no BS we, we you know it's great to be rubbing shoulders with someone who just calls it how it is uh, talks about the facts not the fiction and uh, that's that's the best way for people to learn and uh, sort of start to look at what's right for them and where do they need to go. Yeah, no, right, right back at you. It's, it's. Um, I found that we're on a very similar frequency, which is, uh, which is always nice, right? Um, I think I'm really excited because I genuinely don't know. Maybe haven't done enough research, and I think everyone wants to know, like, what is your like property background? So you've got these twelve properties. I think it is like, when did you start? How did you go about doing it? Because it's pretty rare to find someone um, that has that kind of background. Yeah, okay. Well, with a name like Bushy, I'm clearly a boy from the bush, <laughs> PK. So a country boy from way back, born in a tiny two-horse town. Uh, was a bit physically challenged when I uh, was born. I had a, a hair lip, which well, I had a lot of operations now, and I was a chronic asthmatic. So uh, I, I, I jokingly say now that I was always referred to as the short-ass, flat-faced, punk-chested runt 
at school <laughs> and uh, we moved around a fair bit. So uh, my father was a stock and station agent uh, helping farmers, so we moved all over the, the country. So the gypsy thing and the travel thing has been a, a big part of what I do. And because I was so sickly as a kid, uh, I used to draw and design all the time. I, 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 you know, for many years there, I would spend three out of five days in bed with a pen in my hand. Wow. And uh, you know, I used to used to be a good artist uh, as a result of that because I spent so much time doing it. And my father always used to say, "Well, that's all right, Johnny," because my my uh, real Christian name's John. That's okay, Johnny. But at some stage, you're going to have to get a real job. I was like, well, how do I combine my love of art with a real job? I know, I'll become an architect. <laughs> so, uh, and that that's about as simple as it got. So I, I jumped into the architectural profession and uh, followed the Australian dream, really, PK. So I, I worked really hard as an architect. I was an architect for 17 odd years. And on the outside, I looked like I was living the dream. I mean, I uh, was working on some great projects uh, all over Australia and Asia. Uh, you know, I was, I was the project architect for the Ayers Rock Resort in Uluru. Uh, and I lived out there for about two and a half years to help put all that together and a whole bunch of great projects. And, wow. you know, it looked like I was living the dream. On the inside, PK, I uh, felt like I was trapped on the rat race. I was working you know, seven days a week, 14 hours a day. Uh, I've, I felt absolutely trapped. Uh, and and just couldn't see a way out. I, I was sort of trapped in my own own perfectionism to some degree, and unfortunately, I ended up burnt out, broken and broke. I lost my marriage. I lost everything. I, you know, my my goal at that stage was to work hard, stick money into super, and then tick off the bucket list when I retired, which is you know a pretty common thing. And uh, I burnt the lot, and at the tender age of thirty three. Uh, ended up with nothing at ground zero. You know, I, I often say, you know, my life's been in two halves. Uh, there's BC and then AD, and BC was before <laughs> my crisis, and AD was after the divorce. Because right. uh, at that that stage of the game, I never thought I'd end up in that position, PK. Uh, it, was a, it was a really grounding moment for me because, uh, you know, a country boy brought up to one wife, one bank was pretty much uh, the, my upbringing in that regard. So it was a massive wake-up call for me. I spent a lot of time in the mirror, uh, really understanding what do I need to do differently from this point on to not end up in the same position again. Because the, the old story, you take yourself with you wherever you go and and you're at least 50% of the problem in, in any interaction, basically. Yeah. So uh, I spent a lot of time uh, thinking about that. Um, I've managed to... Uh, Meet my now uh, life partner and, and partner in all things, Sonia. Uh, she'd come out of a similar situation. Uh, so we actually sat down and said, okay, how are we going to live life differently? And because I was an architect, PK, I was, I was used to designing what the end game looks like and then work out what steps we need to take to get there. So it was almost became naturally for me to do that. So right. Sonia and I sat down determined to do things differently and where we started was to say okay how do we actually want to live what does our ideal day week month year look like and as it happens we sat down uh, in a little restaurant in Clarendon south of Adelaide many years ago and we, we were penning this out and the restaurant owner who just happened to be an, uh, an accountant which we didn't know he was poking his head over the shoulder and he said uh, what are you guys up to and we, we told him he said oh, I can help you monetize that I can help you work out how much that lifestyle is going to cost. And that was really the start of uh, what I now call the freedom numbers. So, you know, when we're helping people, we help them get really crystal clear about their freedom numbers uh, up front and early. And for us at that stage of the game, uh, the uh, and I, I can share the freedom numbers because I created a vision board around this exercise right then, which I've still got, by the yeah, way. Yeah, please do. <laughs> and uh, and we decided that we needed to do what we wanted to do. Uh, we needed about 200 grand in passive income a year or an, an ongoing income stream. This is you did this when you were 33, is it? Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I because I, I, I again I was ground zero. I, I literally walked out of my first marriage with my old beat up car and a bunch of cassettes. So I had I had zero at that stage PK. So I was like, I, how am I going to to get ahead? So we worked out that uh, two hundred grand is what we need because we love to travel and we do a fair bit of overseas travel. Uh, in my very simple thing at the time, and it hasn't changed much actually. Uh, it was like, okay, to get two hundred grand at a five percent yield, I'm going to need 
uh, income producing nest egg of about four million. Uh, Fifteen years was the timeline that we wanted to be in that position. And the first thing I did was project forward. If I do nothing differently, uh, where are we going to end up? So we looked at our super and the very limited cash we had available. I had had a few shares, and that was telling us that I was going to end up uh, having to survive on about thirty two k a year. Uh, based on our current circumstance at that time. Uh, And that was assuming I could access my super, which we couldn't, obviously. Uh, So that was like, okay, there's a massive gap there. Uh, That really meant in simple terms that we were 3.3 mil behind where we needed to be. But if we brought it back to uh, what that meant in uh, today's dollars, so what does that mean now when you take inflation out of that number? That, that meant we needed to uh, secure about th- three to four properties based on some average growth rates to get there. So it was a bit rough and ready, uh, but it was a really good start point because that became both the magnet and the compass for us. And this is something that I suggest everyone does because uh, I'll see a lot of people that dive into property to make money. Mm. Uh, that's not a good enough reason because if you don't know where you, it's going to get you to, you don't know what sort of strategy to try and follow. Yeah. So there's a there's a gap between where you want to be and where it is that that tells you what you need to accumulate over whatever your lifestyle timeline needs to be to make that happen. So we we sat down and we did that. I we then uh, Sonia and I decided that we would pursue what we now refer to as the money Madison. I don't know whether you've ever seen the the uh, Madison race in the Olympics where there's two bike riders going around the, around the track. One's going hell for leather on the inside of the track, the other one's resting, and then they sw- switch over like a, a relationship relay is what I, I called it. So what we decided is one party would earn the income, the other other party would build the wealth. So we had the worker and the wealth builder, if you like, and we kept changing over. So uh, the first entourage, uh, when I, I got out of architecture, I did some consulting with government uh, to pay the bills while Sonia built our uh, uh, property management business because we'd started to invest in properties. And in fact, before that, I because I was ground zero, I invested in shares to to, uh, to be able to get the deposit to right. put towards our first property. And that was a roller coaster ride of ever. There was one, <laughs> let me tell you, PK. I, I had some days where I, I was trading CFDs, so they're very oh, high gosh. leverage because I was on a, a hell bent. And I'd, I'd never suggest anyone do this, by the way. Yeah. But there was times when I would lose 30 grand in a day overnight. So that's, you, what, uh, that's what happens when you lever up to 90, 100, 200 percent in the stock market, right? <laughs> it's a scary ride. It's a very scary ride, but we managed to get enough to get our first deposit, right? Uh, and then we're off and running. And and uh, about the same time, uh, I saw my father fall over because uh, my father was my role model, and his he it was one of those she'll be right, mate. Uh, ignored his ignored his body and just just work, worked himself to death. He had a whole series of health issues and spent the last 10 years in a wheelchair dribbling out of the side of his mouth with multiple strokes. And mum was pretty much the carer for all that time. And I'll never forget him looking in the IPK and saying, son, learn from me. Stop following my example. It's about time you got money to work for you rather than you work for money. Uh-huh. And that totally resonated. Uh, it was a bit of a penny drop moment for me. Uh Funny how these things happen in threes, but uh, a mate of mine dragged me along to a Robert Kiyosaki conference in Adelaide. Uh, I was living in Adelaide at the time. And Robert Kiyosaki, the rich dad, poor dad guy, who was actually live there. And I'll never forget him saying that once you make passive income a part of your life, everything will change. And that totally resonated. It was almost like overnight I started seeing the world differently, mm-hmm. PK. Uh, and the template that I've carried forward from when Sonia and I went along to that Robert Kiyosaki thing is that whatever we invest in, whether that be in in property, uh, equities, our businesses, it's got to have a, a potential to create a passive ongoing income stream. It's got to grow in value, and it's got to be saleable. So, if any anything that comes across our horizon doesn't tick those three boxes, we don't we don't take it any further. So, we started investing in property. Uh, and I made every mistake he could possibly make in the in the book, PK. Uh, I didn't trust anyone. I tried to reinvent the wheel, the, the absolute worst thing that you can possibly do. I focused just on the property and then tried to work out what to do afterwards. So I'd got it totally upside down <laughs> in that regard. And I just didn't know what I didn't know. Mm. So, uh, But what, I was a voracious reader. Uh, I read read everything I could get my hands on 
I still am. I just just love reading it. Just you know, I'm a I'm a lifetime learner. Uh, I, I really get a lot of enjoyment out of that. And there's no there's no conversation or book or anything I read that I don't get something out of that that helps on that journey. Uh, and so over over time, my knowledge started to improve. I started to rub shoulders with some really good uh, independent professionals. That that an accountant, uh, the finance side would became pretty clear to me that that was a very important part of the exercise. And, you know, I'd, I now say that property is a game of finance. If you, if you don't understand the numbers and you can't get your hands on the, on the money, then you can't, you can't do much. So yeah. that became a, a really key component of that exercise. And, uh, we started a property management business because we weren't very happy with the quality of our own property managers. And of course, a property manager business has a, has a, uh, it's a saleable rent roll. It has a ongoing income stream. Uh, I then, because I realised that the finance was so important, uh, I, I then started, once the property management business was covering our costs, I then started a finance business. So I knew nothing about finance, but I dived in with a couple of guys that were really finance gurus. And then I grew our knowledge around that component at the same time as we were in parallel with all of that, uh, starting to build our portfolio. So um, uh and and it's the old story. If if your the magnet is strong enough, so we had a really clear vision on exactly how we wanted to live. And and I'm very visual, so I, I literally had that uh, on a vision board, which I, I often look back on. What was good about that is that it was magnetic, which meant that it was so appealing and and so exciting to us that we were prepared to ride over whatever speed bumps were going to occur along the along the investment journey. But it also meant we had a compass because every decision we were making day to day was based on is that taking me closer to that or further away. So it it, it really did crystallise that, and we had because we had those freedom numbers in our head, we had a measuring stick to see how we were actually going along the journey when we would check in every month we'd revisit uh, every year we'd revisit our vision we'd revisit the numbers and if we had to adjust things then we would to to make that happen so uh in terms of the actual property journey itself do you want me to share some of that as well yeah i'd love, love to the, to the extent i mean what you've said so far has got so much to unpack you know we don't have enough time i'm just already inspired you know just it's almost like that underdog story you kind of lost everything at age 33 when you said 33 it rang a bell because i'm 33 right now and i'm okay. always like um you know like you kind of put these artificial ceilings above you saying i've achieved x so so far how much you know what more can i uh, achieve or have i already lived half my life but it seems that you know all of your financial strength and growth actually happened after 33 and i love that um story about your dad as well in terms of inspiring you from the position of like what not to do and having you know that that for me is like almost a penny drop moment and you just saying it that that's really inspirational um i'd love to hear your your property um you know the actual properties where you bought them how they went the numbers but so far it's like you know hopefully everyone's getting and i just want to say one thing as well like with that analogy of the velodrome like active income is important we all know that especially in finance active imp imp income is important but I think too many people become complacent that, you know, I'm like speeding around the, the bicycle track. I'm making 100K, 150K, 200K, maybe even 250, I don't know, 250K. I'll be all right. But then you realize how much or how little they actually save and what their passive income will be when they stop working. And it's like, what was the point of earning all that unless you actually invested in something that gave you a passive dividend or a passive income? So I love, I love that analogy. But yeah, I think we're all, especially me, I'm excited to hear what what you actually bought. Yeah, well, I, I, I often jokingly say now, PK, we became passive aggressive. We became aggressive about everything being passive, uh, and and that's something that we've 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 carried on uh, throughout our investment journey. And I, I'll just say there that. You know, like you, I'm on a mad mission to motivate as many hardworking Aussies as I can to recognise that if they don't start developing what I call parallel perspective, and that is using one eye uh, to look at today in terms of what they need to do, but the other eye in terms of what tomorrow is going to, needs to look like. Because if you if you're clear on tomorrow, uh, that shapes today, and eventually you'll get to a point where they come together. So that, that that's a really key exercise because the the numbers are staggering 
uh, in terms of where most hardworking Aussies are going to end up if they assume that paying off their home and sticking money into super is going to be enough. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the most recent ABS stats, PK, and you're probably aware of these, over 73% of retirees over the age of 65 are surviving on an average of $295 a week, which is 15300 bucks a year. Yeah. Now, uh, that that's a smell of the oily rag existence, and it's a it's a cliff. A lot of people are either going to fall off that cliff or have to work until the day they drop. So I'm on an, on an absolute mission to wake people up to the opportunity that it's this is not a nice to do. This is a must do if you're going to sustain any form of lifestyle uh, long term. And that's for those that are happy to work until their retirement age. A, a lot of us aren't. We want to well and be in a, that position where you know for investment for me is not about property. It's about time. Yeah, and it's about the, the the one thing I would say to people is it's about taking the time now and making the time now. Even when you say you're too busy, because everyone says they're too busy, but make the time now to use the time you've got to get your time back, because because time is the real prize. You know, property is the vehicle, finance is the is the uh, gasoline. Time is the end result. And time is what it's all about. I think too many people make that mistake, right, Bushy, of saying, I want to increase my net assets, my wealth position, my net wealth, and then they become asset rich and cash poor or cash flow poor. And it's like they've got this amazing house, but you know, they can't go on their overseas trip when they want to. They can't pay for the private school fees or, you know, not that you have to, but they just can't live without anxiety. They have this asset, but it's not spitting out cash flow. So so on that on that point, because I, I love everything that you've said so far. Um, what does your portfolio look like? Like I forgive yeah. me in advance if you're not comfortable sharing. But no, no, not. very comfortable. So uh, let me go through it. So I, I, as I say, I made even a mistake in the book. So uh, be, before I got to that stage, I'll just share a quick one. Sure, when sure. I was an architect, because as an architect, we think we know it all, by the way, and, and we know enough to be dangerous. You know, yes, we can design something. <clears throat> it's all about trying to create awards. So uh, I, the, my very first foray into investment was to do a one into four redevelopment in Alice Springs. <laughs> <laughs> Would you believe? So there's some warning bells going off there already. If you if you is thinking. that because that's where you did the um, your architectural project? I was working there. Yeah. I was working there at the time, and and I, a couple of the people I was working with, and a and a builder, we got together and said, right, we're going to do this redevelopment. Of course, we thought we were going to do something that was going to win awards and be so much better than everything else, and therefore it would command so much better value than everything else. What a massive mistake! So uh, we did this one into four. Look the. The properties looked fantastic, but it was uh, way overpriced. No one wanted to pay it. We couldn't sell it. Uh, we ended up having to rent them. Uh, then one of the parties got into marriage difficulties, so uh, th that was a bit of a fire sale. It was an absolute debacle. Uh, it, 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 if you ha had tried to pick a worse exercise to get involved in first first go, that, that was it. Uh, and I, I licked my wounds and learned a lot of expensive lessons from that. And my switch then was because I was about the quick buck. It was like, oh, you know, let's manufacture equity and let's get all of this. Instant tempting, right? It's super tempting. Uh, yeah. what, a, what a mistake. When I'd gone through the journey uh, AD after the divorce, it was more about sustainable mm -hmm. wealth. Wealth by stealth is the, is the term I like to use now because uh, if you can create a vehicle that is growing in value while you're putting your time and energy into things that are important to you, you've got the best of both worlds. So when we started, uh, and again, we had very limited capacity when I started when I was 33. That's a fair while ago now, uh, uh, PK. Uh, we managed to find, and 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 again, we, we'll talk about off-market properties later, but uh, because we had so limited capacity, uh, we were walking the streets, basically, looking at properties, and we saw this property we liked, and we, and we could tell that no one had been living there for a while. So we thought, great, let's let's try and track down. So we put the word out to find out who the owner was. Uh, my my wife, Sonia, has got a nose for things. She'll just, she's a beaver. She'll, she'll find out how. We managed to track down the owner in Vietnam. Uh, and this is back in the days when there was sat phones and phones as big as bricks. <laughs> okay, right. Okay. Uh, it was a, it was a fair while ago. The number, right? <laughs> you got it. You got it. And uh, we, we reached out to him and said, look, 
would be interested in buying the property. He said, well, funny, funny you should call, but uh, I'm actually thinking about offloading it. Uh, and I, th- there's a, a bigger story in behind this, but I won't bore you with it. But we en- eventually ended up picking up, picking up that property for 84 grand. It was a, a three bed, one bath, uh, double garage place. Uh, 84,000 is what it cost us at the time. Uh, we were getting 300 bucks a week of rent, which was pretty good. Because it was right on right near the beach. Uh, it's in a, an area called Aldinga Beach, which is an hour south of, of Adelaide. Great spot. Uh, yeah, it's a, a terrific spot. Uh, almost by mistake, uh, we tripped over this because we were aware that they were creating an expressway uh, motor, motor link from not far north of Aldinga Beach to the city. So, you know, as soon as that was finished, the, the value uh, exploded uh, mm-hmm. and it, it was doing extremely well. We did a major renovation and extension to that property to really give it a facelift. We still got it, actually, by the way. It's And we, we're now airbnb that property and it's worth just under a million bucks. Uh, and so that, that one's performed pretty well. But this was buying in our backyard. My, my right. parents were living in the area. Uh, we it was an area that we knew, so that was where we started. That next property, then uh, a couple of years later, uh, we bought a, a property in Ketch Court. Uh, it's still in South Australia. It was a three two two. Uh, it was getting about uh, we we'd spent one hundred ninety grand on that place, uh, giving us about three hundred fifty bucks a week in rent. So it was about a nine and a half percent yield. And this is in the days where you could borrow ninety seven percent plus LMI. By the way, so we were able to get away with very low deposits, which you, you can't do now. But at that time, we certainly could. Sure. Um, that again, we still got that property. It's worth about um, five hundred grand now, uh, and we we managed to put use the property for crisis care accommodation. So we've ended up getting really good rental yield out of that property right. and, and in, enjoyed the growth. So again, my wife's got this nose for, for thinking be outside the square and rather than just putting in a normal rental, she's found a source that that uh, gave us a much better uh, income flow. But it's about that time we, we recognised uh, because we, we were rent vesting at this time. We couldn't afford our own home. And, and again, by mistake, uh, we worked out that uh, it was better to put our energy into properties we could afford and then rent where where we needed to work, which is, which was what we were both doing at the time. I, I managed to stumble across a really good accountant uh, at, at that stage, who's now, he's still my accountant, by the way. Uh, and he said, you need to start thinking borderless because land tax and everything else is going to catch up with you. You need to diversify. So we then started to look, look beyond that and we bought a 322 in Byron Court and, uh, uh, it was about 260 grand, had a good yield, but the real benefit of that property was a corner block and we could subdivide. So we did exactly that. We kept the existing place. We we upgraded a little bit, uh, split off another block uh, to create a, an opportunity as far as that goes. And then uh, at that stage as well, I got an opportunity to get some lifestyle blocks. So it was a bit of a land banking exercise uh, at that point in time. And mm-hmm. uh, we bought, bought uh, four blocks for about 300 grand each at that stage of the game. Uh, we've actually turned those over just in recently, at the peak of the market last year. We, we've we've gone from the capital growth into the cash flow uh, stage. So we, we're now freeing up some of those growth assets and converting it into cash flow. So we managed to sell sell those blows, uh, blocks off progressively over a couple of financial years to minimise any uh, capital gains impact. And then we got into the build routine because what I realised at that stage, and it's around, around 2009-ish, we realised that uh, from a cash flow perspective, and, and this is something that I want to emphasise as well, this was a slow burn learn for me, mm-hmm. was that uh, to sustain the the distance and, and to get to where you needed to be, the cash flow affordability is absolutely critical. And, and I and most investors I see, they look at the loan and they look at the rent and they look at, that's the gap, can I afford the gap? Well, that, that, that ain't the equation at all. That's only a part of the equation. So uh, what we do and what we did then was invested in some really uh, sophisticated software that tells us exactly how much per week a property would cost once every cost in both buying and holding the property was concerned, weaving in any depreciation benefits from taxation that you can get to arrive at, how much is this property going to cost in year one, two, three, five, 10, 15 and beyond. And that way you're building it all on paper before you commit to anything. Yeah. And again, this is something I would suggest people do. The property is the last thing you actually secure. Get all your ducks in a row uh, first, 
But one of the the lessons we learned, again, through the uh, help of this accountant, was that building property, because there's such uh, significant uh, tax appreciation benefits for new builds, particularly in tightly held areas, uh, and given my uh, background as an architect, uh, I, was, I was pretty good at being able to uh, negotiate that side, so to get really fixed price contracts so that we knew what our costs were. Uh, so Marston Drive was a 422 that we did at that stage. Uh, it cost us about 365. It's it's currently worth about 650, and then th- that got around to the GFC stage of the game. So. Uh, I was pretty adventurous at that stage. We had our broking business uh, working at, at that time. And every, all of our clients were saying, we want to buy a property in the US. And we said, hold up, hold your horse. We'll be the guinea pigs. We'll go over to the US uh, and suss out whether it's any good. So we spent three months over in the US, traveling from the East Coast to the West wow. Coast. We ended up buying three properties at that stage of the game. And, and when I say three properties, they, these are two-story, three-bedroom, double-bathroom properties spread across Maryland, Washington, and Michigan. Uh, they We bought them for between 30 and 60-odd grand. Uh, they were getting gross yields of 25 to 30%. <laughs> we can only so, wish for that in Australia, right? Yeah, but but uh, while it looks attractive, it, there's some pain involved in this right. too, by the way. And and we were blessed as well because the Aussie dollar was at a dollar five US at that stage, yeah. it's now around about seventy cents. So there's some built in uh, opportunity that comes out of that. Uh, those properties have quadrupled in value over that time, and there's a very sophisticated accounting structure that's developed around the ownership of of those particular properties. But it's been hard work, PK. Uh, the Australian professionalism in property is head and shoulders above anything I've ever seen anywhere else. The the Americans are really good at the talk, but not so good at the walk. So it's it's yeah. been hard yards. There's been a lot of late night uh, Zoom calls and whatnot to manage the team because the team professionalism isn't anywhere near what we're used to here in Australia. But that that was that was the essence of the portfolio. As I say, we, we've we've now shifted from the what I call the capital growth to cash flow stage of the equation. So we've been transitioning some of our assets now into more cash flow vehicles uh, as we as we continue to go. But mm-hmm. but the the benefit of all that now is that uh, you know was it, what was it about a bit over five or six years ago we, we hit the the magic uh, financial freedom number, and I can't tell you the two hundred k. Yep. Yep. Uh, and and that hasn't changed much actually. That that's more than enough to do what what we need to do. Yeah. Uh, but once once we've hit that point, just the I can't put in words the the I just felt a weight lifted off our shoulders. Yeah. And, and and now we work because we want to work, not because we have to work. There's a, there's a massive difference in your outlook on life when you get to that stage. Yeah. And having the freedom to put my energy into things that are really important to me is just. Yeah, you just can't put a value on it. Yeah, you, you can't be what you can't see. And I think the value in, in me hearing from your experience and perhaps the audience as well is that, you know, these types of numbers are possible. Like you've very articulately and accurately taken us on your journey. It hasn't been a journey of five years, hasn't been a journey of 10 years. It's been a long-term journey. Property investing is a long-term game. But when we see the carrot on the end, on the stick, you know, at the end of that journey, um, and it's not been an easy journey either. It's been ups and downs. You say you're a perpetual learner, but you got to the goal. And I think, you know, there's some people out there, um, that perhaps don't have that patience and enthusiasm simultaneously for real estate to get a, a passive income like 100, 200K. But I think from your story, what I'm deducing and, and what I'm gleaning is that if you do have the patience and if you do have the enthusiasm to stick at it, I mean, you invested in the GFC or just after the GFC when the Aussie dollar was at parity with the US dollar. And it was effectively like an FX play almost, right? You're making like as much on the FX play as you are on the properties. But you yeah. were in, like the point is you were investing. You weren't like, okay, 2008, world shuts down. 2009, what's going on? 2009, Greek goes you know, bankrupt. 2011, the European Union and all of the, all these countries are like, you know, faltering and will to, it, there's always something to say, ah, oh, it's too much, too much uncertainty. You just carried on, you just plowed forward, you know, regardless. And I think that's something to take away and, and you got there and that, that's very, yeah, that's really cool. <laughs> that's really inspirational. I, I love that. Um, I, I wanted to ask you, 
in terms of that journey, so it's 200K passive income, I think 12 properties you mentioned, um, you know, like when you started or through that journey or perhaps now, like in 2023, what were the traps um, that you fell into or perhaps that you avoided um, through your experience or, you know, for people who are like listening to you and they've only got zero, one, two, three properties and want to emulate what you've achieved, you know, nowadays, correct me if I'm rock bushy, but nowadays there's like a million uh, different pieces of noise in the property atmosphere. You could say there's one person saying do NDIS, there's another person saying do developments, there's this person saying high cash flow, affordable properties, that one saying blue chip, negative gear, and you know, now there's a million podcasts. It's just really hard, you know? Like what are the traps that at least from your own experience you can say to people like, guys, be very careful of these. Yeah, that's a really good question. So, and I can get, take that in a thousand different directions. But what, what I'd I'd start to say on that PK is that there is no one size fits all when it comes to success in property. It's about what is right for you, your situation, your risk appetite. So, listen to everything, take it on board, and and the more you listen, the more you learn, that the better you'll understand what's going to be right for you, because there is a, a the mixture of risk and capacity. But also one of the other key things in this whole equation really is how much time do you have to manage your investments? So the, the, the mistake I see a lot of people make is that get, especially the get rich quickers. And, and my view now, having, having looked at this for a long time and having, having researched uh, property cycles uh, in different locations right across the country, if you're looking for sustainable success in property, it's a minimum of a 15 year journey. Now, you might get lucky and do it earlier than that, uh, but it's going to be more luck than good management. If you embrace time as your friend rather than see it as an enemy, which a lot of Australians do, we're, we're, we're trying to push up against time. If we say, no, it's going to take 15 years. Let's sit back and relax and, and enjoy it. Invest with confidence that the best time to invest is when there's the most uncertainty happening. Because what happens in that equation, and, and, and you well pointed out, when we jumped on a plane to go to the U.S., the world was ending in most people's minds. The whole world was going to go into meltdown at that time. And we thought this is a once in a generational opportunity to pick up properties that were way below their, they're ever going to be this cheap. So uh, we, we, we see uncertainty as the, as the crucible of opportunity, PK. Yeah. So the more negative noise you're hearing, the better opportunities there are. And, you know, I, I, this is nothing new. If you listen to Warren Buffett, the, the world's greatest living investor, he'll he'll always say, be greedy when people are being fearful. I mean, yeah. it's, you know, that's a, that's almost a, a hackneyed term these days, but it's, there's a lot of truth in that. So uh, the more noise there is, the, the more there are the opportunity that's there, but uh, don't chase shiny things. Spend some time working out. Again, go back to how do you want to live? How much does that cost? And then if you do your freedom numbers, if there's a gap between where you uh, want to be and where you're projected to be, then you need to focus on growth. That's as simple as that. Because I hear this argument, uh, cash flow versus growth. Well, the focus needs to be growth, but then the key thing is to structure your investments in such a way that it's going to be affordable ongoing. So that affordability piece, and I mentioned it earlier, it's an absolutely critical uh, part of the equation. You need to build that out on paper before you commit to a property at all. If you know how this thing's likely to cash flow and you're confident that that cash flow is going to be affordable and do worst case analysis on this so that uh, you're making sure that you've got the horsepower and you've got some rainy day reserves. One of the biggest traps I, I see investors make is they take it to the limit. They don't have a rainy day reserve. And as soon as things get out of kilter, they're forced into a situation where they have to make a, a, a yeah. short knee-jerk decision and suffer the consequences of that. Yeah. So, so make sure you've got plenty of horsepower. And there's some pretty simple ways of doing this, by the way. Uh, you know, one of the, the key things that we uh, assist investors with is what set up what we call a war chest, which is a, an equity loan against their existing home, if that's that's where they're getting their equity from. The build-in breathing space in that war chest to cover situations if they're out of a job or the, the damage on a property or there's no rent for a period, they're not having to make a knee-jerk decision. They've got cheap tax-deductible money that they can access 
that's going to cover them through the, the worst case scenario. So that, that will be one of the, the major things is, is start with the end in mind. The property is actually the last thing. Build it out on paper so you know the numbers before because it is a numbers game. Now, I often say if kebabs were giving me better growth and better return than property, I'll be investing in kebabs. Yeah. It's just that property uh, in Australia, given the incentivization that the uh, governments give us to, as mum and dad investors to invest in property, is is better than any other vehicle to create growth. Yeah. So that, that would be one thing. The other thing too I would say is, you know, I, I often say be very careful about uh, exercising blind faith and disinterested trust uh, because that's a very dangerous combination when it comes to securing your future. So don't outsource your financial future to someone else. Uh, you need to know enough to be able to manage your managers. And yes, it is an elite team sport. You need to surround yourself with really good independent professionals. And I emphasize the word independent there, PK, because we want to make sure that there is checks and balances in all the advice you're getting from your respective uh, property team uh, so that you can then decide what feels right to you. So, you know, one of the big exercises I'd say is, is if someone comes along and says, we're a one-stop shop and we do it all for you, run. Yeah. Because there there isn't any checks and balances. They'll cover themselves. They'll tell you what you need to hear rather than what you probably uh, should be hearing. And that's, that's when you can get yourself in serious strife. So that continuous evolution of your knowledge uh, and is going to be really key because the, the what happens is as your knowledge increases, your fear decreases, and you're you're able to make better decisions, uh, with investing in things that are going to get closer to where you need to be ultimately. So that that would be a, another one of those. Uh, the I know uh, you know having spoken to you before and uh, having had a look at some of the stuff that you do uh, on YouTube, etc. Uh, there's a big question mark around buyers agents, and I'm I'm a supporter of buyers agents. One, if they if they're really good, and two, if you have zero time to do it, but you've still got to manage your managers. So uh, the, the unfortunate thing about buyers agents is that there's a very low barrier to entry. Uh, so we, we're seeing people who are, you know, a spray painter yesterday and a buyer's agent today. They don't have the level of understanding or expertise. Uh, one of the key things I say to people when you engage anyone in your property team, uh, doesn't matter how good they are at what they do, if they don't invest themselves in the way they're suggesting you invest and they can't prove it to you, don't use them. Right. Absolutely as simple as that. that. Show me. Don't tell me. Show me. Show me. Let me talk to other people. Uh, to work out what you're doing, to actually ascertain whether you're actually as good as what you say you are. Because in, in the particularly, in, I hear a lot of buyers agents at the moment saying, "Oh, we've, you know, we've bought these properties in the last couple of years, and and we've uh, achieved massive equity growth." Well, Blind Freddy would have uh, enjoyed equity growth during the COVID period. That's not that to me. That's almost irrelevant because it, it it makes no sense. So, mm -hmm. so making sure that you have enough knowledge. To be able to manage your team, it's a, if I use an AFL, I'm, I, I like the AFL. Yeah, <laughs> PK. So you know, if you, if you're trying to win the premiership, you wouldn't rock up on your own and try and play the best AFL team in the competition. You, you wouldn't go very well. Mm. What I think you need to do is surround yourself with key players, and those key players are a really good accountant, a an investment savvy mortgage broker. A, a property strategist, if you aren't clear on that, you're not able to put your own strategy together, then there are some really good uh, strategists. And and Pippa is a great place to start as far as that, that is concerned. Uh, a, a property manager is an absolute key player. Now, I'm a, I'm a, a little bit uh, biased in this because, as I say, my wife and I built a property management business, but we did it for a couple of reasons, not only because we wanted to make sure our own properties were being managed, yeah. but pro property managers will tell you what the truth is, not what they think you need to hear. Yeah. And a good property manager will know the ins and outs of an area. They'll know how that particular property compares to other uh, other properties and location. They'll know the perceptions of areas because things can look great on, uh, on, the, de on the desktop, but local perceptions of a particular location are really important to its ongoing value because that sentiment thing really comes into play. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they will have the longest relationship with your property than anyone else in the, the whole equation apart from you. 
Yeah. So, again, quality is key here, though, PK. Uh, there's a pretty some pretty average property managers out there too, by the way. Yeah. Uh, and, again, my, my wife, uh, when we're helping people on the exercise, she will interview every property manager in a location that's been suggested that a property needs to be identified and they'll identify the person, not the brand. The brand make, makes no difference, but the person that is going to be best placed to, to give advice pre and post yeah. purchase of that yeah. particular property. Amazing. No, I've, I've always said I couldn't agree with you more. Property manager, like I, I get it. Pro, you know, property investing is a game of finance. Mortgage broker, the lending side is so important, but just I don't know what it is, but I really feel that in my own journey, the property manager has been the one that I've just, I've lent on the most. And, and I really attribute my somewhat success for what it is to the property manager, to the whole team, but really to the property managers. And I, I like, I love what you're saying about not outsourcing the responsibility, not outsourcing the accountability. And that's exactly what you guys do in No Have Finance. Like this is why we're on the same frequency. We, we lead or we step first with education. We want to empower people, the number of people who might be a little bit in all sorts now because they expected rates to be at 2% forever from two years ago. Like they didn't have someone like you who actually has a robust, you know, bulletproof system by which they can map out their finances now and in the future at all the buffers, et cetera, et cetera. So look, I, I, I couldn't, I wholeheartedly agree with you. I'm just conscious of time. So I know I have to respect your time and, and for everyone, I have to go pick up my son from kindy in, in a couple of minutes as well. So I'll just, just wrap up. Um, I guess the last question really quick and uh, forgive me for asking you to answer it very quickly is, um, you know, with respect to interest rates, you know, you've been there and done that. You've been through multiple interest rate cycles. Are you freaking out right now? Are you like looking to retire some properties or are you like suggesting that people, you know, have the, their finger on the trigger or should they be pulling the trigger right now? Uh, I've, I've always said for some years now, PK, it's it's not a matter of when, it's what and where. So uh, the best time to buy a property is every time you can afford to. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's about where you buy that property and what type of property you buy. So uh, again, as I've mentioned earlier, I love times like this when there's a lot of fear floating around in the, the exercise. We're shifting into a buyer's market. So it's a there's a great time we're seeing agents now forcing vendors to discount properties. And I, I watch this all the time right across the country. Yeah. There's been some very significant drops in asking prices for property in pretty quick, short space of time. So the sellers are getting nervous. This is a great time to be taking advantage of that. Uh, but just do your numbers on worst case. Again, build it on paper first before you go and buy it. Uh, and you know that there's a there's a lot of information out there that can help you get very accurate around what the true cost of that property is going to be, but the the sustenance in the exercise is to make it affordable and maximise your buying capacity. So my my quick advice on this is make sure you get an investment savvy mortgage broker involved right now. Uh, don't leave it because every time there's a rate rise, your capacity comes down. A quick rule of thumb on an average five hundred thousand uh, dollar mortgage for every one percent rise in rates, your buying capacity drops by $100,000. Yeah. So uh, don't wait because the capacity, every time that goes up, that, that's coming down. Cash yeah. flow is king. Uh, make sure you're building in rainy day reserves. So if you don't have the rainy day reserve there through yeah. equity or other means, don't do it because yeah. you won't sleep at night. That sleep at night factor is, is really key to sustaining this exercise. And then make sure that that savvy mortgage broker Uses lenders that are maximizing your capacity because yes. capacity is at the strains. And, and there's 2,000 loan solutions and over 40 lenders out there. Yeah. And it's a 55% variation in buying capacity from, from the wow. bottom to the top. So there's yeah. massive variation in, in what you need to do there. Yeah. So don't rely on the big four. There's lots of opportunities out there. And then the, the, the last piece of advice is be careful how you purchase the property. So if cash flow is really important to you, particularly early on, mm -hmm. uh, we use tenants in common uh, to actually really help us in relation to that cash flow because we could slant the percentage of ownership towards the the higher income earner yeah. so that, uh, and then uh, get a a lot more of our hard-earned uh, tax staying in our pocket. And then the other thing, if you're employees in particular, is use a good account to help you with the PAYG withholding tax variation. Yeah. So rather than wait to the end of the year to get the, the 10 grand back, Get yeah. that 200 bucks a week, which smooths the cash flow, eases your what's between your ears, and, mm -hmm. and most 
most people self-sabotage. But yeah. you can also use those funds to plough into paying off your non-deductible home loan, which will save you tens of thousands in interest and carve uh, years off the actual home loan itself. This, like, just by you mentioning it, there's like so many things that I think people need to learn from you, Bushin, and and that are just kind of like almost uncommon sense. Like they're they're common sense, but they're very uncommon. Like people don't know about. I mean, some of them you've just mentioned here. So I would highly, highly recommend for anyone who's watching um, or listening, go go. You know, just Google Bushy. Um, you know, you can find him on the the podcast. Um, Get invested and in Realty Talk. Maybe start there. But go check out his um, company as well in terms of finance solutions. Um, I, I highly, highly recommend that know-how property finance. Um, and just, just lastly, I want, I want to just thank you because you're super. I don't know what it is that you're super humble guy. Like you know, there's not many people who are making 200k passive income who've been in there and done that, who are just openly educating and just like you know passing it on, so to speak. So on behalf of uh, my audience and community, and of course myself, I just want to express our gratitude and, and thank you, Bushy. Yeah, I'm very hum humbled and honoured to to join you, PK. It's it's great to rub shoulders with someone who has a similar outlook on life. Uh, the the uh, I guess j just in passing, I'm really keen to keep the conversation going, PK, because I I think we've just scratched the surface. I mean, I've I've had you on Get Invested, and I'm keen to get you back. So let, let's let's keep that conversation going because uh, I am hell bent on helping as many hard working Aussies to wake up and shake up to the need to get invested now. Uh, because if you don't, you're going to be very sorry down the track. And there's, it ain't rocket science. I haven't invented it. It's just applying uh, age-old rules, but the devil's in the detail. So you put the whole jigsaw together, and this can be a very enjoy enjoyable ride. It's simple, but it's not easy. So yeah. it is hard work. But let's yeah. not let's not uh, you know gloss over that. It is hard work, but yeah. anyone can do it if they've got the fortitude and they've got the means. Love that. Love that. Let's let's keep it there. Well, thank you so much. And thank you, Bushy. Guys, give it a subscribe. Give it a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Comment. Uh, you can ask questions. I'm sure Bushy will chip in and, and sort of share some answers. But thank you for being with us. And once again, thanks so much, Bushy. My pleasure. Thanks, PK. Thanks for tuning in to Get Invested on the Property Hub podcast channel, your home for property investment insights and inspiration. And don't leave yet until you've taken the next step towards living by design by getting my award-winning book, Get Invested, absolutely free when you sign up at knowhowproperty.com.au or bushymartin.com.au. And finally, make sure you subscribe to Property Hub to get your weekly dose of Get Invested inspiration along with every episode of Realty Talk, Australia's leading property show for red-hot property investing news and insights direct from industry leaders and influencers. Remember to always get invested in your knowledge and I look forward to seeing you next time.